Fine. I think everybody is out there enjoying the refreshments from what I can hear, but there are a few hardy survivors, good. Um, I've been thinking about all this great visionary innovation stuff that we've been listening to, um, and now suddenly we get to the misery of finance. And uh, I've been trying to think of the, the, the nature of the link, and I suppose it's pretty obvious that if we are trying to think of an area where the innovative propensities of humanity as lauded by one or two people not so long ago went seriously wrong, then I suppose the object lesson is finance. And so if we can fix that, uh, tame that, make it work for us rather than against us, it will be a major social achievement. Uh, we have uh, an incredibly distinguished uh, panel. I'm looking forward very much to what they have to say. Um, uh, and uh, I think we should have a very, really very good uh, discussion. I would, however, um, um, I would feel really very guilty if I didn't at least make a few comments about what I think are uh, the issues very, very briefly before we start. We're going to discuss uh, have we repaired financial regulation since Lehman? I prefer uh, have we fixed it because repair suggests that it actually did exist before Lehman and, and of course there was nothing to repair we discovered. There just wasn't anything there at all that worked. So repair is clearly the wrong verb. Um, so we'll forget that and just think about whether we fixed it. Um, this raises an incredibly wide range of issues about the role of finance in our society, uh, what it's fundamentally for, uh, how it fits in within our monetary systems, the values it embodies, uh, the sorts of institutions it needs. Uh, but beyond that very big set of questions, and I, I would be very happy if any of the panelists discuss them, I think there are uh, five very swift points that I would make about what we've been trying to do uh, in the last uh, five or six years since the crisis. Um, the first is clearly this is one of the biggest uh, stable door closing exercises in the history of humanity. Uh, and that it looks like it too, because, uh, and that's really uh, my second major point. In essence, my reading of the situation is that they have basically decided, and it's not surprising, that they want to keep the system they had before, but just make it more resilient than it was before and less macroeconomically destructive. And I think a really big question is, was that a good objective? Was that really what we should have been trying to do? And the third point to make is that in the process of making it uh, 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 a more resilient, d stable door closed sort of system, they, we have without doubt ended up with bigger banks and a much more concentrated financial system than before. Uh, now you could, can think of that as the law of intent, unintended consequences or intended consequences, but it's clearly a consequence. Um, the fourth point, which I owe particularly to Andy Haldane, so I've taken away one of his points, which will allow him to be briefer, is, <laughs> but I'm sure he won't take the opportunity, is that the regulatory process we've created is unbelievably complicated. Uh, and for those of us like me who think that keep it simple, stupid is a pretty good motto, this is enough reason to doubt whether it's going to work uh, whether it's fixed. And in addition to that, in addition to that, we've tried to embed the regulation of the financial system deeply within macroeconomic policy and particularly monetary policy. And the interface between those two things is really untried territory. So those are sort of my introductory points about where I think we are. And um, so I'm now going to ask uh, our panelists in order to say up to 15 minutes
on have we fixed the financial system since Lehman? And I'm going to start uh, with Anat Admati, whom I've known uh, uh, with enormous pleasure since the crisis began. And I'm reasonably confident that I know her answer to this question. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, and uh, he sits in front of me, so I have to thank personally both uh, Rob Johnson and INET for allowing me for, I think, the fourth time uh, to, uh, well, to scream, but try to keep my voice low uh, here. Uh, so I'm gonna, it's not going to be exactly the same talk, but there's going to be some themes. And the title tells my answer, which uh, was maybe anticipated. Uh, so I'm going to go more into, you know, here we are and a little bit bewildered about why, although I guess when you get used to things, you kind of think that's, well, how come you didn't figure it out before? So here's a diagnosis, and I think may, maybe some of you have heard it before, just all the bullets of what's wrong system is extremely fragile, it's extremely dangerous, the public is exposed to risks that don't have to be exposed to. Some risks we want, some risks we're exposed to anyway. These, some of these risks are entirely unproductive, unnecessary risk. The economy gets distorted. Severe governance problems throughout this system and all the way to those who manage it and control it, also outside the banks. And a system that cannot be functioning well without regulations. Good regulation, not just any regulation, any complex regulation, but effective regulation goes to what needs to be done and why we're regulating it. As a result of all these problems, this is a system that's continually a drag on the economy, just an inefficient system and dangerous beyond uh, the, that. Now, what makes it so fragile? A lot of debt, which causes uh, sort of quick distress or insolvency, at least concerns about it. Not just any debt, short-term debt that is runnable, that creates liquidity problems, and huge interconnectedness. I'm going to show you some more pictures today, which creates any kind of number of the contagion effects, and we've discussed this before. And then the regulation has all these things that are wrong with it. It doesn't look at the right things. A lot of things are hidden. It allows all kinds of ways to evade it and get around it. Uh, it has not yet fixed this massive risk hiding in derivatives, it uses systems of risk weights that have been completely ineffective and actually harmful. So here is sort of the way you can think about financial intermediation today, layers upon layers upon layers of somebody wanted to create an institution outside the other institution and connect them all together. So instead of having a system where there's an intermediary, we now have this Ruth Goldberg machine uh, Rube Goldberg machine with thousands of layers, and when you look at the big posters of the shadow banking system, you're like, well, where does it begin and where does it end and why? So somebody wanted to create these, and in each one of them, somehow they kind of make money in some way for the people involved, otherwise they wouldn't do it. So you have to wonder about whether we're getting kind of value out of each of these nodes. That's what happens when one of these things starts cracking, uh, and here is, just from last week's IMF report, uh, just a picture. There are many of those kinds of pictures. I'll show you another one. This is flow across countries. So this is the way it's global. And the thickness of the line is sort of the, the how much connection these countries have. And this is important because it's particularly important, for example, for the possibility of failure, because you fail in different legal regimes. Here, I'm going to show you the picture from the cover page of this. Iceland was a little tiny lab, laboratory, where the entire system collapsed in 2008. This was the growth of this system before uh, to 10 times GDP or, more, or, or whatever. Whoa, sorry. Uh, and this is a book that was translating part of their report, the commission report, asking, trying to ask how, why, why did anybody stop it, and what can we learn from that? That's translating 2,400 pages plus appendix in Icelandic to a little book that tries to tell the story. Here is from that report. This is 300,000 people interconnected because they could get a hold of all the transactions for five years. And these are cross ownerships in the 
just in Iceland itself, 300,000 people, a company that owns more than 1% of another company, going around in circles, all not just a total uh, sort of uh, pyramid schemes and all of that. This system becomes incredibly distorted. One of the big evidence the pieces uh, exhibits for that is the persistent, and by now everybody admits it, of these impossible to fail without harming everybody uh, entities, whatever you call them, to blank to blank. There are many variations on this thing. Being in this position uh, gives you perverse subsidies that you can increase, of course, and I'll talk some more about that. For the real economy, what also matters is the fact that this, this, in, this system, in the end of all of this, doesn't make efficient lending decision. It is subject to booms and busts. It makes too much and too little lending, sometimes at the same time, sometimes one after the other. It's, uh, and, and, and part of that is precisely because of the leverage, and I'll talk about that. The governance problem are always of the sort of who makes the decision and who is impacted and whether those that are impacted have control. And here we have a fundamental problem that those who take the risks uh, benefit from it and all those that are harmed, uh, or many of those that are harmed, have no control over this. What to do? Well, there's various directions and I can't, I don't have time to go through all of that, but they come to let them fail somehow, find a way to let them fail, or let's break up, ring fence, Volker, split them up in some way, the activities. Potentially not handling the interconnectedness either, which was there before. So are we just stuck with this system? Is this the best we can do because we can't live without this system? Uh, my analogies have to do with pollution and the fact that we subsidize pollution when we have a clean alternatives. Can we change that? somehow. The other one is a speeding analogy, which fits very well. Uh, big loaded trucks speeding through residential neighborhoods at 90 miles an hour, telling you that's a natural speed. They're really good drivers. And we um, then might send the ambulances when they implode and say, oh, we sent the ambulances, the best kind of ambulances just for you. We did it just for you. Uh, and the question is, can we put and enforce speed limits for these trucks so we don't have the collateral damage when they implode? If you ask why the drivers drive this fast, because they have special ways to get out before it implodes. Uh, so one of the solutions that's an absolute no-brainer is to have them be more resilient, if you could do that, but in a dramatic way. When the loss chops up the, egg, the, uh, the assets, there's starts to be concern. Maybe the bank is insolvent. Everybody runs for the door. And now we might bail them out. But along the way, we had a credit crunch. We had a disruption to the economy. We're still recovering from that. This is from Andy Heldines, one of Andy Heldines, many, many papers on this. Uh, I'm very well aware that you know, the fortresses seem just as fortressy through the crisis, and we didn't see anything on those accounting numbers. So I, the fortress balance sheet of Jamie Dimon is a complete myth. How much equity? Well, these are the numbers that we're talking about, and they're very proud in the US that this week they finalized a somewhat tougher leverage ratio, 5%, 6%, a number that does not have the right number of digits in it. Uh, and uh, because nobody in the economy lives like that. And why should the most dangerous entities live like that? What's wrong with, uh, with going to equity investors and showing them what you've got and getting whatever they, they pay you? Or maybe you can't because you're a zombie bank. That's possible. Uh, so the confusion starts from not understanding the what side of the balance sheet we're even talking about. This debate is not about their reserves or what they hold. That I want to just put in the warning right now, because that's when you really start listening to, I can't lend the dollar. It's sitting in a, in a vault. They hold capital. No, no, no. We're talking about how they fund and how much debt and equity they have. And so this confusion is insidious and pervasive, and it helps the lobbyists a great deal. Um, so we have Basel III, and maybe a slight tweaks on Basel III. Martin Wolf is my, yeah, my favorite quote on that. Tripling almost nothing doesn't give you a high number. Um, and John Cochran, in a review uh, of, of a book I wrote, uh, captured the essence of what we're trying to do there. How much? Until it doesn't matter, until the risk is back on that balance sheet and not 
with the rest of us. At least the downside risk is, is, is there, whether it's 20 or 30 or 50 percent. Uh, here are the facts. Banks tell you that they're very special, but they're not special in making risky investments. Lots of companies where the part of the world I come from in Silicon Valley make much riskier investments. They don't even pay interest every month when they're able, and they might end up in a total loss. In the US uh, uh, market, where equity markets are good and where you can always retain your earnings, everybody can do that. Uh, most companies have no problem funding with equity, and we even wonder why they don't borrow more. Uh, large shareholders come to, sell, to tell them to take advantage of tax benefits of debt. Um, so retained earnings is the first source of funding in the pecking order. Not so for banks. Banks, Berkshire Hathaway, a very profitable company, doesn't ever make payouts. They just keep investing. And the share price keeps going up and up and up. There's, not, uh, there's a lot of digits in that stock price by now of uh, Warren Buffett. But banks have very little equity, and they keep paying out. Perfectly good money that they earned. Just now they were approved again. Why they love to borrow? It works for them is the answer. It works for them. They are, I don't have time to go through all the economics of it, but basically once you borrow a lot, you become a little bit addicted to it. If your previous creditors would allow it, you will keep borrowing. And who are the previous creditors of the banks? Depositors. We go into the bank and give them the dollar and we don't give a contract that constrains what they do. We hope the regulators will do that. We encourage debt by the tax code, and then we stand ready to catch them if they fall, and they know it and everybody else knows it. Then they design compensation structures that chase returns without adjusting for risk, which is this is, it captures everything that's wrong, paying them to gamble. So banks can get funding from different sources, and if they use a lot of debt, they pollute the economy. What do we do? We give them subsidies and incentives to choose more debt, and therefore they respond and pollute our economy. Do they pass on these subsidies? We throw blanket subsidies and they do whatever they want to do. If they like derivatives more, because more ROE, they go there. The business loan is not exciting enough. Not enough upside. That's a clear debt overhang effect. What do we get from that? Booms and busts and an inefficient system. Um, subsidies are distortive and are uh, huge. There's no economies of scale in banking uh, beyond $100 billion. There's no proof of this once you correct for the subsidies that you get once you become very large and benefit from uh, the fact that you fail with everybody else or you will drag everybody into the failure. And these subsidies uh, are large, however you try to measure them, which is tricky, but there's big debates about that right now all over the place. The banks, of course, yesterday, in a Lobbying document, deny it. Large is beautiful for the clearinghouse. So what ends up being the result is we perversely encourage financial pollution, which ends up with more and more and more inefficiency and recklessness and too big to prosecute and no accountability whatsoever. $100 billion of fine and no problem for the people there. I believe one of the panelists will talk about uh, stress test because he's been researching that. I can tell you that when they say, oh, we just passed a stress test, uh, don't buy it for a number of reasons. The stress tests are complicated and totally numbing. The stress tests are based on assumptions that do not capture what's really going on. We do not have that interconnected map to know what's going to happen. Yeah. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. OK, so now I want to get to my pictures. My pictures uh, are the following. We have a shoddily constructed building. Uh, the system persists. Why? Here are quotes from a book called Why Wall Street Always Wins. Unfortunately for, the, for America, Obama and Biden were both financially illiterate. This is uh, somebody who worked with Biden and then with Ted Kaufman. And now he quotes Volcker uh, in a conversation saying, you know, just about whatever you propose, no matter what it is, the banks will come out and claim it will restrict credit and harm the economy. He took a long pause while Ted and I leaned closer. This is Ted Kaufman. To hear what he said next, it's all bullshit. This was confirmed by the New Yorker, and Volcker apparently said he remembered saying BS. So they checked it off. As, uh, so I can debunk all of that. Will it ever change? I have quotes in the slides which you can look at later. Going back to Larry Summers in 2000 saying, the root cause of crisis is increasing re re salience of long term, 
Panics and runs are now driven by Sunspot. It's the extent of fundamental weakness. Uh, he talks about corny capitalism. Preventing crisis will depend on strengthening core institutions and other fundamental. This time is not different. Here we are. If you go to the very end of uh, the book by Reinhardt and Rogoff, they say we've come a full circle to the concept of financial fragility in economies with massive indebtedness, highly leveraged. Com economies seldom survive forever, particularly if leverage continues to grow unchecked. Encouragingly, they say, they were hopeful in 2009 or 10 when they wrote it, history does permit warning signs that policymakers can look at to assess risk, if only they do not become too drunk with their credit bubble-fueled success. So the political economy of nonsense starts with the epigraph of chapter eight in a book I wrote. It's difficult to get a man to understand. Okay, so I will just say that they have a lot of narratives and that we don't have safety in the system because we don't have black boxes to tell us what's going on. And that my effort here is to explain these issues uh, because I always run out of time and empower more people to be able to speak up so they don't get intimidated by banking emperors. And there are copies of this book outside, which uh, I hope you will take if you think you can make use of it. Thanks. I'm sorry I cut you off, but uh, we're going to have a great discussion. Great discussion, and you gave them enough very potent slides to look at. Richard Bush Daber. Thank you. Um, just, uh, I, I need to give a disclaimer before I begin that my remarks are my own and don't reflect the views of the Treasury. Um, if you, uh, these slides, by, uh, I'll have slides a little later on because I want to demonstrate some points, but uh, these won't be relevant for a little bit. Uh, if you were a risk manager over the course of the 2008 crisis and managed to still be standing uh, towards the end of it, the thing that you would have been confronted with over and over again is what was the problem with value at risk? You kept on showing me that my value at risk was such that I would only lose at the 5% or 1% level $50 million, and now I've suddenly lost $400 million. You know, how could that be? There was a real castigation about value at risk, and most risk managers understood that value at risk only made sense if the assumptions behind it were followed, namely, if the future was drawn from the same distribution as the past. So the value at risk measures were useful if the future looked like the past, which meant that they were good about 98% of the time. And unfortunately, the time that they weren't very good was when you really needed them during times of crisis. Uh, unfortunately, the management of most banks didn't understand that or were happy not to uh, bother to understand it because it would get in the way of leveraging and keeping up with uh, other banks in uh, their pursuit of levered earnings. So after the crisis, as the dust settled, in terms of fixing the system, people said, OK, we can't use value at risk. What are we going to use instead? And they said, well, we know that the problem with value at risk, among other things, was that it only made sense if the future looked like the past. Obviously, when you have a crisis, it doesn't look like the past. So we need a measure that can untether us from our dependence on the variance-covariance matrix that's existed historically. And so people started to use stress testing more and more, and it became de rigueur with the regulators. So you have CCAR and so on. Uh, so what we've done, and by the way, stress testing did exist even at the trading desk level for years beforehand, uh, but it ended up being more dominant for sort of bank level and regulatory level risk management. So now the problem with VAR, with value risk methodology, which I call risk management version 1.0, was that Again, it, it's good in normal times, it's not good in crisis. Although I'd have to say, if somebody put a gun to my head and said, give me one number to tell me what the likely risk is of my portfolio or of my uh, inventory or, you know, of the bank over the next month, I'd still use value at risk. But what we did is we moved from value at risk in response to the crisis to the stress tests, which ended up being basically uh, this version 2.0, which had their own problem. And the, the main problem they had is not so much 
that they only name certain scenarios. So, you know, what are the odds that one of the scenarios that you would have put into a stress test before 2008 was a problem with some subprime mortgages? The problem is that it's static in the following sense. I'm a regulator and I go to bank A. I say, here's the stress, what happens if this occurs? Oh, we lose $5 billion. I go to regulator, I go to bank B. What'll happen to you? I'll lose $7 billion. Bank C, I'll lose $12 billion. The next thing you have to ask is, okay, $4 billion, $5 billion, $12 billion, when all that money is lost, then what happens? And that's the thing that's missing from this risk management version 2.0. It's not looking at the next order effect that occurs when you have this sort of a crisis. And so in terms of repairing the issues from 2008, I'd argue in this very narrow setting of getting a good risk management structure, we have not repaired it because we're missing the essential dynamics. And they're essential because they are what is behind the major crises that occur. There's two types of dynamics that I would focus on. One is called an asset-based fire sale. The other is called a funding-based fire sale. An asset-based fire sale, and if you go back to history of, say, LTCM, this was sort of the canonical case of this, you have a shock to some asset market. People who are highly leveraged suddenly get a margin call. They have to liquidate in that market. Well, if that market's already dropped a lot, they probably can't liquidate very well in it. So if you can't sell what you want to sell, you sell whatever you can, so they start to liquidate in another market. Now that price drops. So everybody who happens to hold that asset suddenly gets margin calls, they start to sell, and you have this cascade and contagion from one asset to another. A funding-based fire sale is the same sort of contagion and cascade, except it starts not from a shock to an asset, but from a funding shock. For some reason, funding is withdrawn, typically from a bank. That withdrawal of funding forces them to liquidate assets, which leads to an asset fire sale. Other banks, seeing what's going on, start to hoard liquidity, so they're not willing to make a market, so liquidity drops, which precipitates even more of a drop. This is the sort of dynamic that you have to capture if you're going to deal with systemic events. So how do we do that? How do we get to what I call risk management version 3.0? Well, one technique which I'm involved in developing at the Office of Financial Research to assess financial vulnerabilities is what's called agent-based modeling. Uh, there's a paper, if you want to just Google OFR Bookstaber agent-based, you'll see a paper that I wrote on it that sort of introduces it as a methodology. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it here, but the key thing about agent-based modeling versus neoclassical methods are the following. Unlike the typical neoclassical methods which have a representative agent, you can have heterogeneous agents for an agent-based model. You can have a Goldman Sachs and a Morgan Stanley and a Citibank each of which have their own behavior rules. They observe and react so that you get feedback. Uh, when the environment changes because of actions, people observe, or the entities, the agents observe what's happening and take action based on that. You can have rules that are heuristics rather than optimization. Uh, you can have influencing each other and your own behavior. So all these things that, and by the way, you don't have regularity assumptions and partial equilibrium frameworks so that if uh, the train starts to go off the tracks, there's not some mystical force that puts it back on the tracks again. Now, what I want to do is show you uh, from the agent-based model that we're developing a couple of slides um, which will, will kind of illustrate how this can be employed. Now, this is basically a schematic of a network uh, that where we have investors to cash providers to the bank dealer who passes flows of uh, funding to hedge funds and others, and going the other way is securities and collateral. Now, of course, there's more than one cash provider, there's more than one bank dealer, there's more than one hedge fund asset manager. So this is kind of one segment of the broader network. And I've sort of exploded the view of the bank dealer to illustrate that actually the bank dealer has a whole bunch of sub-agents. It has a prime broker who provides a credit funding transformation to hedge funds. 
It has a trading desk that provides a liquidity transformation to the asset managers. It has a derivatives desk that provides a risk transformation. Uh, the key point in this is I'm not representing just a network. Uh, as the flows go from one node to the other, things are happening to those flows. There's risk transformations, credit transformations, and so on. And unless you take those into account, you can't get a good indication of what's going on. You know, networks are very interesting, uh, and I'm glad that we can see the complexity of the system based on them, but they really don't do a lot more than sort of, boy, that's really cool. Oh, look how complicated that is. You need something that can get to the dynamics. Now, what I want to show you is with a very simple model of the agent-based model, I'm just going to have three assets, two hedge funds, two bank dealers, one cash provider in this simple diagram. Uh, the hedge funds are circles. The assets, the three assets are squares. The bank dealers are triangles pointing up. The cash providers pointing down. They're laid out in this particular way just because you'll see it's easier to visualize things. And the arrows are trying to do double duty. They obviously are, uh, show the direction of the flows of the, the effect. Uh, the thickness will show in the following charts the degree to which in aggregate the influence occurs, how much a hedge fund is influencing price. And the color will indicate how emergent or current that influence is. Uh, also, the size of the color within the object, the square, the triangle, will show the capital of that particular agent. And what I want, I'm doing is to demonstrate this, I'm going to impose a shock. So think of an, a model where I impose a shock in asset zero. You can see that there's a little white area around that square. Prices have dropped about 10%. When that occurs, that affects the cash provider because collateral is now not as, as good, so he's going to reduce funding. It affects the bank dealer because it holds inventory in asset zero, and affects hedge fund one because it has exposure to asset zero. It's not affecting bank dealer two or hedge fund two because in the models I've structured it, they don't have exposure to this asset. So if we did a static stress test, we'd be done right now. We'd say, oh, the bank dealer lost $4 billion. Oh, the hedge fund lost $1 billion. OK, that's the end of it. But it isn't the end of it, because as we go from period 0 to period 2, I'm just skipping a couple of periods here, things move forward. The, basically, hedge fund 1, having had the shock, now is forced to liquidate. It happens to also hold asset 2. So you see a big shock of movement from its selling to asset, sorry, to asset one, and asset one starts to drop. The cash provider now reduces its funding, which feeds back to the bank dealer, and now you see that hedge fund two is getting affected because it had exposure to asset one. So now you see the start of the, the cascade occurring Hedge fund one is shocked, it liquidates, it liquidates at the other assets it holds, asset, hedge fund two has it, now it's embroiled through contagion. Now we're looking at period two to period four. Now you can see that we now have washed up to even where asset two is starting to get affected. Why? Because in this particular model, at hedge fund two has both asset one and asset two, it now has been shocked to the point it has to liquidate. It can't liquidate enough of asset one because it's so much under pressure that now it starts to sell asset two. So now asset two is getting affected by the market and it starts to drop in price. Meanwhile, the cash provider is starting to reduce funding not only to the bank dealer number one that was embroiled initially because it had exposure to the shocked asset, but it's also affecting uh, bank dealer two. And bank dealer one is having an effect on bank dealer two because bank dealer two has counterparty exposure to bank dealer one. So now you've washed all the way over and finally the effect is, is completed. OK, good. I'm, I'm, uh, timing's pretty good on this. So, uh, so finally you get to the, the last case where this the effect has washed through the system, 
And what just happened, you had a shock to one asset. And the final result, if you look at it, this is a pretty dramatic case. But if you might, might notice that there is no color left <laughs> in hedge fund one, bank dealer one, or hedge fund two. So hedge fund two is sitting there saying, what happened? I didn't even have asset zero in my portfolio. I did my stress test, and there was no result. I, I didn't lose anything, yet I'm out of business. So this, I think, is the failing that exists right now in terms of the stress testing that is occurring. When you are at the level of systemic risk, these second order effects and the way things wash through the system is really critical. And let me just go back. I'm just going to go through these. Just watch how things kind of move from right to left as you go through this. That's the type of analysis that's necessary to get the sense of where effects can uh, move into the market and how a stress ultimately can lead to an asset-based or funding-based fire sale. Now, this last slide just illustrates another point, which is you need to stress more than assets. You can have a price shock, which is on the upper left, which is what I just did, but you can have a funding shock where the cash provider just pulls away and reduces funding. You can have a credit shock where basically the bank dealer has a credit issue and uh, has a counterparty risk that passes to bank dealer two and has a funding effect for the cash provider. Or you can have a redemption shock, not so much with hedge funds because they have gates and so on, but if suddenly everybody pulls out of some big asset manager in a day for some pick a reason, for some reason, you can have a funding uh, redemption shock. So, okay, so, uh, that's, that's it. That's also the last slide, fortunately. But the, the main point, and I'm, I'm focusing on a very small aspect of the market, but one that I'm intimately involved in now, is that in terms of risk management and monitoring, although we are moving from version 1.0 to 2.0 in stress testing, we need the tools and the modeling capability to go the next step and to deal with these types of dynamics and contagion. And the one area for doing that, I believe, is using these sorts of Asian-based models. Thank you. That's very interesting. I think it will raise lots of questions. So nice discussion. Andy. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, and thank you to Rob uh, and to Inet for having me back. It's always a real thrill to be here. Um, so today, I want to try and answer this question, uh, as simply as possible. What I want to do is show you some pictures, some facts on the extent to which the financial system has reshaped itself in the light of the reforms over the last five or six years. I want to assess uh, that reshaping by looking along two dimensions. Uh, one dimension is the structure, the underlying topology of that system. And the second are the incentives embedded within that system. Why structure? Why incentives? Because if reform is to be durable, if it is to durably curtail systemic risk, you need to act on either or both of the structure of or incentives within that system. So I'm going to give some pictures. The facts should, I hope, speak for themselves. It's you to reach the judgment on how reshaped our financial system really is. Let me uh, start, though, just by um, giving you some sense of what the reform program has been. I list here some of the initiatives, some of the bigger initiatives. They are many and various. And I've scored them here in terms of how far we have got from design through to full implementation. Some are further progressed than others. None, I would say, are yet fully complete. I'd say we're roughly halfway, maybe a bit more than halfway, towards having fully implemented that which we have set out. Martin called this the closing of the stable door. For someone who's been there doing some of this, it's felt much, much less glamorous than that. Um, 
more a sort of shoveling of the, uh, sh of the uh, more a shoveling of the stable than uh, a closing uh, of, the, uh, of the door. Nonetheless, we have not been thanked for our shoveling um, by the financial sector. Each one of these initiatives at various times has been said to be potentially life-threatening to the financial system. It would cripple balance sheets. It would squeeze the juice out of uh, business models. It would bring the system to its needs. Let's see whether that has been true. Um, I want to focus in particular on the fortunes of the world's uh, biggest banks, because fortunately, uh, the Financial Stability Board has designated uh, 29 such banks as GSIBs, that is globally, systemically important banks. They've gone further and identified the structural characteristics of those banks that make them systemically important. Things like size, things like connectivity, and things like complexity. And those are the three dimensions along which I now want to assess uh, the big uh, banks. So this picture, to describe it for a second, the blobs. The blobs are banks. The blobs are the 28 GSIBs. The flags are the nationalities of those banks. The sizes of the blobs measure a set of structural characteristics, in this case, size. And the green blob at the bottom measures the average across that population of 28 blobs. This measures the asset base. Back in 2006, pre-crisis, the average GSIB had a balance sheet of around $1.35 trillion, roughly the size of an average G7 country. How crippled have those balance sheets been over the intervening period during which that slew of reform has taken place. Well, fast forward seven years. Here's the position uh, today, or at the end of last year in 2013. You'll have seen that the blobs haven't shrunk. The blobs have continued to, if anything, inflate. The average blob is now has a balance sheet of around $1.76 uh, trillion. Particularly large growth, for example, in some of the Chinese banks in the far right-hand side. Size, if anything, bigger. What about interconnectivity? There's no perfect way of measuring that. The FSB point to one or two metrics. This is one, which is the size of the derivatives books of those big banks, measured here in notional value sense. Back in uh, 2006, the average, the average global SIB had a notional value of derivatives outstanding of a rather remarkable $19 trillion, or roughly a third of global GDP. What has happened over the intervening period? This is what has happened. That derivatives portfolio has grown by roughly 50% to, on average, be around just, just over $30 trillion for each bank within this population. Different metrics of interconnectivity tell a slightly more optimistic picture. Here's a measure that looks at the, the wholesale funding of those GSIBs. Back in 2006, slightly more than half of the balance sheet of banks was wholesale funded. How has that improved? Well, a bit but not much. Still, roughly half of those now bigger balance sheets are funded from entities elsewhere in the financial system. What of the third dimension, which is complexity? Again, a tough thing to measure. Here is one potential metric, the number of distinct legal entities within each of these banking groups. Back in 2006, on average, each of these firms had in excess of 300 distinct legal entities. Some had 10 times uh, that number. Fast forward 
to 2014, that number is roughly exactly where it was back then, if anything, slightly north of what it was back then. This metric speaks to complexity of balance sheets. If you look at the complexity of assets, for example, the fraction of the balance sheet that is more complex traded instruments. Back in 2006, that was on average around 20%. Seven years forward, it remains around 20%. The one structural dimension along which there has been quite a shift, and in some ways perhaps the most important, has been leverage. Back in 2006, the average global systemically important bank had leverage of an eye-watering 32 times. Initiatives like Basel III and leverage ratios have brought that down. Today, it sits just north of 20 as a leverage ratio. How comfortable should that make us feel? Well, to provide some context, if you're 20 times leveraged, then if the value of your assets falls by 5%, you are in the gutter. How often would you expect the assets of a bank to adjust to fall by five percentage points? Well, if history is any guide, uh, roughly every 20 to 25 years, we're five years on for the crisis, so if we're lucky, we'll have a repeat performance sometime in the next 20 years at these levels of leverage. How comfortable does that make us all feel? So much for the structural characteristics. What are the incentives? Incentives are a tricky thing to get a metric of, but one clear diagnostic on incentives, and indeed on distorted incentives, is the extent to which the market is underpricing risk by dint of banks having an expectation of being bailed out by the government. We can begin to measure, as Anat mentioned, those such implicit subsidies. One way of doing that is looking to our friends in the rating agencies who assign different notches of support to the probability of the government riding to the rescue. Back in 2006, the average global SIB benefited from around half a notch of implied support from the government. As we live through the crisis and look at the situation today, in March of this year, that implied degree of support has risen to in excess of two notches. Now, uh, there's some good news here, which is our friends at Moody. Moody's at the end of last year decided that at least for US banks, they would remove that expectation of support, but other rating agencies have reached a different judgment. And what's more, if you use a different metric of implicit subsidies, this is one that the IMF have developed based upon bond prices rather than uh, on rating agency ratings. That would have said, this is the IMF's analysis, that back in 2006, 2007, those implicit subsidies across, across the GCIB banking population would have been uh, something like uh, 12 billion per uh, per, per region, or more like 60 billion across the world. Uh, today, those implicit subsidies are more like 600 billion, which is comfortably excess of the total profits of the banking system. Incentives haven't very obviously been reshaped in a positive direction from this evidence. Another metric on incentives might come from looking at pay. Pay matters a lot to risk-taking incentives. Back in 2006, the average CEO of the global SIBs paid themselves a reasonably comfortable salary of $20 million uh, per year, some a lot more than that, especially if you lived in America, judging by the sizes of the blobs. The good news is that fast forward, uh, and as of at least last year, the average big bank CEO pay had shrunk quite materially to something close to the minimum wage at a mere $9 million uh, dollars 
uh, per year. Over that period, of course, bank profits and revenues also went through the floor. You might want to rescale this by that shrinkage in revenues. If you do that, as this chart does, it's total stuff expensive over total revenues. Back in 2006, um, bank staff in the biggest banks were paying themselves roughly 40% of revenues. Today, it remains at around exactly the same level. Relatively little evidence here of pay or comp or risk-taking incentives having been too fundamentally uh, reshaped. I said I would let the facts speak for themselves, so I will not provide uh, a conclusion beyond saying, beyond saying plainly, 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 there is unfinished business. Whether you look at structure or incentives, we have not seen very much repair. We have seen little by way of uh, reshaping. We have seen almost no radical reformation of the system that we inherited back in there. Two more minutes. I'll be done in one, Martin. I'll have my one minute back later on. Um, if after having completed this reform agenda, we find ourselves in the same situation, I hope, I hope that we will have the intellectual courage to look again and to do more if more is necessary. I say all that without having even touched upon other parts of the financial system that may themselves be a repository of systemic risk in future. I've said nothing of shadow banks. I've said nothing of clearing houses. I've said nothing of asset managers. Each and any of them may in future themselves be a time bomb waiting to explode. We are still in the intellectual foothills of thinking about those risks and nowhere close to having fully reformed them. The good news is that that will keep regulators like me in a job. Whether the remaining 7 billion people on the planet will be benefiting from that, it remains to be seen, Martin. Let me stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm Ed Kane. Um, I hope my slides are up. I have a very complicated title. I want to make sure you understand it. it, it uh, those of you who aren't from the US might not recognize this is about a story of a, a rabbit that is captured by animals that want to eat him. But says, rather than eating me, throwing me in the briar patch would be a much greater pe penalty. So whatever you do, don't throw me in the briar patch. And of course they do, and then he laughs at them because that's where he lives. So uh, the, uh, the other part is the word flummery. What, uh, what does flummery mean? Well, it's Shakespearean English for bullshit. So, <laughs> so if, they, if they will give you the next uh, uh, slide here, uh, this really sums up my view of Dodd-Frank, Basel III, and global swaps rulemaking. And what it does is it shows an elephant that is, you know, whose pillow is labeled regulators. Um, and a uh, hog whose uh, pillow is labeled megabanks. And uh, the, I think they cho the cartoonist chose the uh, uh, elephant for the long Pinocchio-like nose. And I know he chose the pig uh, because it's the most voracious and intelligent creature in the animal kingdom. And that you may know in the United States that wild pigs are uh, feared creatures in many regions, certainly in Arizona where I live now. So the main point of the cartoon is that financial regulation is a rigged game. The principal players are regulated institutions, regulators, and, and I include with them uh, politicians, and then taxpayers who, who are, are the ones who are playing at a disadvantage. We have ethically challenged institutions that build political clout and feel absolutely entitled to hide salient information from other players. And to do this, they use a number of time-tested tricks in accounting and uh, also always a bunch of innovative ways. And the regulators often help them invent in innovative ways. Any of you who know about the SNL mess, we had something there called regula the regulatory accounting principles, RAP, 
And the, the only thing that was established, if I can use an offensive word again, is that rap is crap. That uh, they, they did everything to hide losses, to delay their recognition, and allow uh, insolvent zombie institutions to go on for a very long time. Now, regulators are playing both sides. That after all, the the people that appoint them are connected to some degree to the the taxpayers, but uh, they also are in a, a partial coalition with the regulated, as, as I've just said, not only to help them with concealment but also to cooperate in overstating the effectiveness and fairness of the regulator's own plays. The capital requirements are a perfect example of this. Um, they, the regulators express way too much confidence in their control strategies, such as capital requirements, and then they overstate the enforceability of things like capital requirements. Uh, we've got all kinds of rules. There was never really anything wrong or uh, terribly wrong with the rules we had for uh, banking and, and uh, investment banks. What was missing was supervision, both within the firms and uh, from government. So it really was a problem of desupervision rather than deregulation. You've got to get to the next slide at, at some point because I'm almost through <laughs> reading it. Uh, but anyway, think about this. The taxpayers actually own the regulatory agencies, but they're deceived by accounting and examination procedures that forced them to play from a poorly informed, disequilibrium condition. They would never play this way if they really understood how, how uh, the game is rigged against them. But what, we have to, what I'm going to argue is that we need to reconceive taxpayers' role in the regulatory game, that they are actually equity investors of last resort, but they're denied the protective rights of disclosure and redress that are accorded to explicit shareholders, even minority shareholders in the United States are, are treated much better than taxpayers, and we'll get back to this. Now, I have another cartoon. The whole presentation is built around three cartoons. And in this next one, I argue that the banks use regulators to run a protection racket, which, I, which results in theft by safety net. And so what we have in this picture is a gleeful mega bank executive holding a gun on a, uh, a combination of Uncle Sam and John Bull to get across the, the two most important financial um, regulators of the world. And uh, very dutifully, the uh, regulator is picking the pocket of a hapless taxpayer. So. Um, the main point to make is that the bailouts are being framed by regulators, by politicians, by bankers as a kind of insurance payout or even a loan. But that's a very poor way, uh, realistically, to portray them. They're actually coerced wealth transfers, which is a very good definition of theft. Um, so the regulators actually provide uh, loss-absorbing equity funding to, to zombie firms. Zombie firms being firms that would be bear, declared dead and buried by their creditors if they didn't enjoy the uh, government guarantees. So they provide this funding when private parties are running for the exits. So th that, uh, this means that whereas insurance and loans are things that we talk about as being risky in the, in the Knightian sense of risk, but uh, what they... All, require us as taxpayers to handle is the Knightian uncertainty, the uncertainty where you can't put down the probabilities that you're going to be hit, but you know you're, you're in a bad position. So the ready availability of, of government credit support to zombie firms subsidizes destructive tail risk. And you don't see, anytime you take such a risk, when you put it on your balance sheet, it's a plus. It looks like you're doing fine. It's when it falls apart that things, things go bad. So we need to re to take the supervisory process, which is very broken, uh, and re-engineering re it to attack the subsidies. That is, the thefts as we would attack any other crime. That is, we have to have laws with penalties for, for criminals. I'm saying that these people that pursue tail risk at the expense of taxpayers are de facto career criminals. And, and we have to stop treating them as the elite of our countries. Uh, that when they bring the taxpayers into this kind of uh, uh, mess. So the, super, the, the, the tail risk can be increased 
in, in, uh, in ways that really make it impossible for capital requirements to be the answer. That uh, tail risk can be increased without showing in the capital, and uh, the accounts of insolvent firms have shown themselves to be very creative in finding ways to, hold, to hide losses until things are too late. So let me explain to you how awful the taxpayer's equity position is. It's inferior to that of shareholders in five, at least five ways. The first is taxpayers cannot trade their positions away. That you've got it, you're stuck with it, and even hedging it is very hard. The best way to hedge it is to buy uh, stock in firms like AIG and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac when, when they're in the bottom of a crisis, because if they're allowed to keep going, uh, they will come back. And AIG, I don't know whether you know it, uh, never hit zero, the stock, and, and is now back exactly to its peak, or in the range of its peak. Now, secondly, ordinary stock has limited liability and uh, unlimited upside. But the taxpayer downside liability is not limited, but the upside is, as soon as the, the firm starts to recover using this cheap capital it gets from taxpayers, then uh, the gains go more and more to the shareholders. Third, the taxpayer positions carry no procedural or disclosure safeguards. In fact, people are trying very hard to hide it. And they're also not even recognized legally as an equitable interest. We couldn't have a class action on their part in the United States. Protected firms can exploit them without worrying about lawsuits. And finally, managers can and do abuse taxpayers further by blocking or delaying recovery uh, and, and uh, resolution. So what am I saying? I'm saying that there isn't a way to improve the system uh, tremendously, and that is for the worst firms and managers to be prosecuted as criminals. But the firms, it's enough to do the firms. That we're talking about how breaking firms up. The genuine reform would compel the, in the United States the Department of Justice to prosecute these mega bank holding companies uh, that engaged in easy to document securities fraud. What would be the consequences? What's the evidence of it first? Well, the evidence is they have made representations and warranties that are demonstrably false and you can show met all the five tests of fraud, deliberate deception, intent to benefit, uh, deception is material, uh, intent is to get taxpayers to, to re and investors to rely on the misrepresentation, and finally, investors and taxpayers did rely. So uh, this evidence is strong, and then f if they were convicted felons, the companies, uh, they would have to break themselves up because in the United States, subsidiaries of felonious companies could no longer take insured deposits or act as broker-dealer firms and futures merchants. Now, you may think, well, you can't do this to companies because they're not persons. But corporations actually fought very hard to get the Supreme Court in the United States to declare that they were persons. So you, you can, uh, we could have a tremendous change on incentives if we can broke up some firm I mean, convicted of, of, of this felonious um, uh, misrepresentation fraud. And uh, this would give a huge incitement to behave better in the future for those that were left. Now finally, we have to understand that capital requirements have actually failed us again and again. It's been the keystone of regulation in the United States since about 1966. But eventually, governments must measure and service these uh, safety net subsidies directly. That is, if, we're, if we taxpayers are equity investors of last resort, we deserve to have that measured and surfaced. That's what we do for any other stockholder. So. Uh, let me just summarize the themes of, of uh, my presentation. First, that to align incentives corporate law for giant financial institutions should recognize that the safety net makes taxpayers uh, unfairly compensated and coerced equity investors. So we should get better returns on our position than ordinary shareholders. Secondly, taxpayers deserve to be protected from this expropriation just by simple fairness of, of, of rule, rule of law. And, but regulators have been assigned other and conflicting goals that keep them 
of this from being uppermost, especially when institutions are tr in trouble. So there are several things we could do. One of the points I've been emphasizing in other presentations is the top regulators need to be trained and recruited in a more apt fashion. In the United States, what you need to become a top regulator, first and foremost, is connections. And these connections leave a trail of debt, which can be used to manipulate regulators. Uh, and second, uh, we could actually establish a single purpose trusteeship at all of these G GCIFs, or we, I call them GCIFs for institutions. But uh, once we've designated them as this, then uh, there should be a trustee. Two more minutes. I'm in good shape. Um, so uh, then, then these trusteeships should have the power to require managers to see that taxpayer, taxpayer equity stakes are calculated honestly. That isn't to say perfectly accurately. In fact, one of the things that bothers me when people talk about value at risk is they talk about a single number. You know, in statistics one, you learn there are no point estimates of any value. You need the interval estimate. So for someone to say it's $5 billion or something, when it could be uh, when a reasonable confidence interval would extend out to $500 billion, um, is, is a very serious misrepresentation of what it's supposed to accomplish. So, um, and we nearly need this to be serviced. Now, I have one final cartoon, which really gets back to how I would have titled this, this session, that um, not that have we repaired financial regulation since Lehman, but, uh, Lehman, but how have we renegotiated financial regulation since Layman, and we haven't done much. First, I wouldn't say dated from Layman. I think it was AIG was the most mistaken uh, event that occurred, but certainly you want to combine it as the Fannie, Freddie, Layman, AIG event, because it was like a double U-turn in policy. First, we helped uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, then we uh, butchered Layman, and then we decided, no, we wouldn't do anything to the creditors of, of AIG. Anyway, uh, the, whole, the point of this cartoon is, this is a mega banker, he's explaining that um, mega institutional criminals are, are fighting to, to keep taxpayer equity positions undisclosed and certainly unserviced, that is with no dividends on them. And this man is simply telling us it's just good business to do that. In some ways, this has been really quite a simple discussion because we have an unambiguous, unanimous answer to the question, which doesn't often happen. Have we repaired the financial, reg financial regulations since Lehman? The answer is no. Um, so that's not very surprising. There are, however, I think just a couple of two or three sort of interesting questions uh, that arise out of the presentations, which I'd just like to touch upon, sort of try and be give reasonably quick answers so we can get to the floor in about five, ten minutes. Um, the first question, which I think I'd like to start with Andy, but um, Anatan might want to comment on it too, is the, the point that Ed has made at the end, which is clearly correct. There is an enormous, it's implicit in your own points and yours, there's an enormous implicit taxpayer equity here, which is... Uh, uh, and I've written this myself, the, the, the regulators stand for the taxpayer, um, and the regulator has completely failed to perform their function um, in prosecuting malfeasance and indeed uh, is, uh, is part of the problem. Um, first, Andy, do you agree with that analysis? Second, do you think, which I, I'm trying to understand what Ed said, I'll get back to it, that legal mechanisms and explicit articulation of um, the taxpayer position is a way to go, are a way to go, and that one of the great failings of this whole process, to put it very crudely, is one, nobody's gone to prison, and two, or even though they have admitted malfeasance in many cases, and, uh, and two, that the explicit and clear interest of the taxpayers not recognized as being um, part of the balance sheet of the banks. Thank you, Martin. I um, thought you'd like that question. So, uh, so, so to the first part, if it is it correctly, uh, 
Um, uh, everyone failed. Uh, regulators were plainly uh, a large part and parcel of that. Um, but they're in good company, uh, including you know academics and uh, and journalists. And journalists, yes. Um, um, but, not, but not all. With, with one or two honourable exceptions, um, to my left, um, we roughly speaking all got it wrong a bit, and most of us got it wrong a lot. Uh, I think. Um, prudential regulation, the notion of systemic risk was not really in the bloodstream of any of the regulations we drew up. So for sure we were partly, um, partly culpable. Um, as for legal mechanisms uh, and, if you like, how best to reshape incentives in, in, in the language I uh, you, no, that's, that is just another way of putting the same point. It Should is. The, is it a central part of the reshaping of incentives? Well, I, I take to be one of the most powerful aspects of the uh, Admati Helvig thesis is not just the accounting fact that you have more equity there, it's the incentive effects that flow from it, that I, I've, and that should correct me, that I view as as important. In, in delivering a uh, safer system. I have to say, for, for me, uh, and you know this, Martin, because you were actually a commentary, uh, you commented on, on, on the paper, I think um, uh, one of the dogs that has not barked, one of the reform proposals that, that's seen no real progress has been the governance question within banking institutions. A situation where we let the your stakeholders typically representing less than 5% of the balance sheet, dictate the fortunes of the firm, doesn't sound the right way around uh, to me. Uh, so asking some basic questions about the PLC model, as it, the governance model, as it applies to banking, is a, um, a furrow that so far is unplowed. And I think rather than being in court all the time, might be a structural mechanism that would reshape incentives in ways that wouldn't necessitate that. And that, what would you like to add on that? What I would like to add is completely that it's entirely our diagnosis. This is a big governance problem, and precisely as, uh, as you said, and we were in a conference in, uh, uh, together where, where I said exactly this. What kind of corp shareholder governance is it when most of the money is not the shareholder's money that are invest is being invested? One way to handle this is maybe to, to really have board representation of essentially of deposits or the deposit insurance, uh, which is focused on the downside and would need to have a voice maybe in, uh, in what happens, including whatever boards decide. That's something that can happen uh, in principle um, by law or some other way. Certainly there's a governance problem, a very deep one. Our idea was that maybe give, nudge shareholders into caring a little bit more about the downside. But I agree that the numbers we're talking about, that's nothing, completely. Does this mean, I mean, I've thought about this. Ed, perhaps some, maybe Richard would like to, should the FDIC be, have a seat on the board as a shareholder uh, representing the public? I presume it would be the FDIC in the US. It, it's always seemed, I thought about this quite a bit, There's, there are pretty clear conflicts between your role as a shareholder and your role as a regulator. So could you be a bit more clear about how you'd handle these governance questions? Well, as I say, I have a, I've done a lot of work thinking about the trusteeship because the problem is if you give the FDIC this role, it may very well affect who can be the head of the FDIC. Then maybe a Sheila Bear could never be appointed because she would be too aligned with with the taxpayer. So what the idea of the trusteeship with the individuals would be at risk. I was a trustee for a teacher's insurance, which is a big pension fund, and they bought insurance, but still the insurance costs a lot, so they, that is going to also lead to uh, the better the trustees, the, more, the better they're aligned, the less this directors and officers insurance would, would cost. But uh, there's a lot of people say my age and only a little bit younger at the end of their careers, who would be happy and, and want to leave this as a legacy, that they would be 
a trustee. And they, as you say, they'd be board members too, but they, they would have clear responsibilities to manage on behalf of this set of shareholders that aren't recognized today. Can I just follow up with Richard now, because it's another angle of this, and if you want to add on this, which is the way I read what you say, which is essentially the risks are so complex and interwoven. You had the simplest possible model there, right? Uh, two assets or th yes. three assets and two players and two burger deals, and you still would be pretty difficult to work out where you were going to be hit. And indeed, when I look back on the crisis, in a way, the, to me, and to remember, the shocking thing is really the event that caused this utter meltdown was a trivial event. So, really trivial. So, isn't the conclusion from your own analysis that risk, that actually assessing the risk of the system is impossible? The only thing we can do is simply enormously to increase its resilience, which takes us in a nut sort of direction and maybe liquidity requirements and so forth, and abandon the stress test approach because it actually can't be done. Yeah. For your own, once you get to n dimensions of this complicated matrix through time, surely you'll, you'll, you won't be able to solve it. Right now, I, right now you know, we, we have a, a broader sort of model that we're testing. So. In, in theory, the nice thing with an age-based model is we could have 80 banks and 4,000 hedge funds, and if you have the CPU, you can do it. So the question is, how many do you really need to get a, a reasonable picture, and how much is a reasonable picture? So given that we have no clue right now in any quantitative sense, in my view, what the dynamics are, if you can illuminate it even 20%, you're 20% better than you were otherwise, and the thing is that the nature of what we're trying to do, which is systemic risks, the, the nature of systemic risk is, first of all, whatever is causing it has to be pretty big and readily manifest. You know, it's not like something happens in one day. And I don't think, although we see these extremely complex networks of many, many banks, my, my goal initially is to say, let's, let's first do it for the five or six big money center banks in the US Let's add to it the biggest hedge funds, asset management firms. You know, maybe you have 15 to 20 asset classes. Does that solve the problem? Are you going to capture everything? No. But I, I don't think that uh, the, the object of this model is to say, oh my gosh, this is such a mess and so complex, I guess we can't figure it out. My hope is that we would be able to, over time, get a better and a better sense of what sorts of shocks essentially what you want to worry about is something that can strike into the heart of the system. And that tends to be the funding side of the system. So there's a lot of shocks which would just dissipate out without much of a concern. Yes. Uh, and that be very, very brief because we, yes. th for some reason you all apparently want to go to a cocktail instead of listening to this fascinating <laughs> discussion. And I'm told I have to stop very soon, which is very depressing. So I'm not very quickly in Ed and then I'll go to the floor. I want to ask why all of this effort? That's my question. From where we are right now, what is the purpose of deciding that we can just measure the speed on this corner of the neighborhood to be, you know, 87.7 might get us through the next thing? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? These institutions cannot go through bankruptcy. They fail Title I living will requirement. We got to do something to change it. The entire approach takes the system as given, and that's what I don't understand why we're doing. What forced us to accept this system? Ed. Well, the, consider the stock market valuing this firm. Now, that's a very difficult job, but the stock market does, on average, a fairly good job, and they don't try to build it up necessarily in this way, they're looking in terms of profitability and where the source is. So I define systemic risk as the value of taxpayers' uh, position in, in a firm. And, if you, and uh, I have actually spent a lot of time with colleagues to develop numerical estimates of at least the value quarter by quarter uh, over 36 years. And again, you got to put a confidence interval around it. But when it, it gets big, uh, the, up end, the upper end of that interval gets big, you know there's need for more intervention. Again, if you think of this as crime, a crime wave, 
you put police in where the trouble uh, is occurring. Andy. I have a dream, Martin. Um, and um, because finance is complicated, but it's no more complicated than the web. Uh, it's no more complicated in some respects than the weather. But actually, we can track the web, and we can track the weather. Uh, and my dream is that one day, maybe in the not too distant future, someone will be sat there in a Star Trek chair like this, with a screen about that size, watching the contours of global finance in close to real time. In the same way as we do for weather, in the same way as we do for the, for the web. And if you've got that, then you can run a stress test, and you can walk this through the system. I think that's, that's well within our technical yeah. grasp. And, and I think you know, weather is a good example of this, because 15 or 20 years ago, if you could get a good prediction of whether it would rain tomorrow, that was great. Now you have 10-day forecasts. Yeah. So you know, obviously, dealing with institutions is different than dealing with a physical system. But you know, to, to not start along those, that path because it seems too complex, uh, you know, you can really look at what's gone on with weather prediction over the last 30 years. I'm going to take a couple of questions. I can't take well, perhaps three. They will be questions. They will be very brief, and then I'll go to the audience. Uh, I can't see very clearly. Somebody there, yeah. Can please stand up, say you are, and ask a question. Very <laughs> brief. Hi, Dennis. Ke Hello, Dennis Kelleher, Better Markets. Um, Andy, uh, great presentation on the facts, but they show that you haven't taken care of what's going on with Lehman, and yet you then say you haven't even touched shadow banking, uh, asset managers, and others, and yet IOSCO uh, and OFR are now going into the asset management business looking at them. Don't you think you should get done the known systemic risks that have already materialized before you start moving into other areas? They're all important, but there's only a few of you, your limited resources and people. Shouldn't you be prioritizing and then attacking things as you move down rather than now, before the job's done, going into different areas? Okay, um, another question, someone down here. Someone at the back, there's somewhere at the back there. I can see someone with the hands up, stand up. Yeah, yes. yep, yep, yep. Can you get the mic to him, I think? Very dark out there. Hi. Um, the question that I have, and who, is, um, who are you? Sorry, David Kempthorn from uh, CG. Um, the question I have is, why haven't we repaired the financial system? Is it the fact that regulators have insufficient statutory authority, or is it because financial regulators haven't got their dream list of items that they need to repair the financial system? Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, that gen yeah, 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 you. That's fine. Federico Fubini, La Repubblica, uh, Italy. Go, would you repeat? Yeah. Federico Fubini, La Repubblica. My question is on um, central banks. How do you relate the persistent riskiness of banks with the ballooning size of the balance sheet of central banks? Uh, I'm asking this because this is something that is considered desirable. We don't think uh, central banks should shrink their balance sheets, even we think they, some of them should keep increasing uh, their size. So this is the financial instability consequent on the expansion of the balance sheets of the central banks? Right. Okay. Well, all these questions seem to be for Andy. Uh, but you, uh, um, the, sorry, the... The asset managers, why are they going after them? Um, yeah, the first question really is why aren't you dealing with the known material, the known systemic, systemic risks, and worrying about all these irrelevances, uh, well, not irrelevance, things you don't really know about. So have you got your priorities correct? Andy, that is for you, I'm that afraid. That is for me, that is for me. I'll, I'll do the first one. So, um, don't know, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, one thing you always get kicked for uh, as a regulator, maybe rightly so, is fighting the last war, right? Uh, and we're meant to be just a little bit forward-looking. You know, what might happen next? What might go wrong next? And that's why we're peering into some of the murkier, uh, murkier corners. Uh, asset management you mentioned. Um, I'm impressed by the asset management industry, actually. Um, because I gave a speech on potential risks from them the other Friday. Um, 
When I give a, risk, a speech on banks, it usually takes at least a couple of months before the, the, the hate mail starts coming in. Um, asset manager, two days. And I had, uh, they were right at it. I mean, really quick off the mark um, with their um, detailed prescriptions of why I was wrong. So maybe you're right. Maybe uh, that's a good sign that they are alert and wide awake. But I'm not convinced we should completely take our eye off, off the ball because next time will be different. Richard. You know, just getting back to what I was talking about with funding-based fire sales or asset-based fire sales, I, I think what matters ultimately is liquidity and leverage. So if you have something that sucks liquidity out of the market at the very time that people are forced to sell, sell you've got a problem. Uh, so then if you, if you start with that, you want to ask, where does the fuel of funding come from? And if that gets cut off and constricted, you know, can the engine continue? And if people are forced to sell, are, what are the dynamics or the mechanics of the markets that they have to sell into? And will suddenly the liquidity dry up at the very time that they need to be in them? And, t you know, and it could be asset management firms. It could be hedge funds. We've seen it with hedge funds. But really, you know, banks tend to be at the center of a lot of this through their market making activity on the one hand and through their uh, funding of asset management firms and hedge funds on the other. Okay. Do you want to add on that one? Because then we should move on. Tail risk is what's important. To, to focus on liquidity, liquidity com, com, comes very close to solvency per se. That is, when you, the confidence interval on your true economic net worth begins to include negative values, it's harder to roll things over. And that's when it, a trivial event can trigger uh, a, a meltdown. But there was a lot of decisions before that, and there was time to do something about it. And it, it's the tail risk that we must focus on if, if we want to, because that's what's destructive. Taking risk isn't destructive, but and taking not, tail risk is. Sorry. And now I'm going to ask you, why have we, from your hard work at this, why have we failed to repair the system? called willful blindness. The risk is abstract. I was having some slides about that. The risk is abstract. We don't have black boxes. There is the narratives. There is the word liquidity. It was just a plumbing problem. Completely disagree with that. And, uh, you know, a story about how it was a 100-year flood. And they get away with that, those stories that start with how they sent the ambulances instead of starting from their own failures before. And the politicians often push the regulators is part of the big problem. And I've seen this in the US, and it's happening in the UK and elsewhere. So when I see regulators uh, in the US, budgets are cut for CFTC, budgets cut for SEC, and then they throw 1,500 rules at them, and then they go to court. And so um, I saw regulators in front of Congress, and they're, they're reading from the lobby statements. Uh, yelling at the regulators. So it's very political is my answer. That's what I've seen. And there's a lot of just things people prefer to believe within the system or the people working on it that they find ways to tell themselves that uh, somehow, well, anyway, it's not their fault. That's for sure. Fine. Could I just add to that? that people are asking, where will the next problem come from? Well, the greatest danger is in the swaps and derivatives arena, and this is where the regulation is considerably under-budgeted and misfocused. It's disgraceful. Andy, final question, because it says here, wrap up. I don't intend to be too worried about this. You know, I mean, what can they do, shoot us all? So. Uh, they can all go off for their drink, of course, being <laughs> polite, but why would they? Why would they? Okay, you've expanded the balance sheet of the central banks massively, and that is also true of the Bank of England, which relative to GDP is roughly, roughly where the US is, Fed is at the moment, though the Fed is still very actively expanding, if at a slower rate. Um, what is that doing to the financial system? Is that part of the next round of crises? How long have we got, Martin? Um, <laughs> I've already said a, we can Rumble. talk to one another. Or they might cut off the sound, but we could probably do so. And I'm sure the audience wants to hear your answer, and we'll wait for their drink. <laughs> so um, what to say and, 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 and keep my job. Um, <laughs> the, um, 
uh, no one's in any doubt uh, that uh, we're in deep, uh, and you wouldn't start from here. Um, but we've got plenty of time. We've got time on our side. Uh, and it's hardly as if it will be a surprise. Um, central banks have been telegraphing how they'll do it, if not when they'll do it. So uh, for sure it'll be bumpy, but hopefully not, uh, hopefully not uh, too bumpy. Um, it was done with the best of intentions. Uh, and that was to inflate risk taking at a time when it was deflated. Uh, there's no question that if that was the purpose going in, then the act of going out will put that into reverse. But provided we do it in a stage managed and graduated way, I'm pretty confident that we won't be the source of the risk next time around. But don't hold me to that. <laughs> OK, both statements. Uh, uh, I will take both statements on that. And I think you got out of the question reasonably neatly. Um, it's the job of the moderator to summarize the discussion. And in this case, it'll be a particular pleasure. Uh, and anyway, nobody can answer back. Uh, <laughs> I think there is complete consensus on this panel that the answer to the question, as I said, is no, which is pretty disturbing given the range of views on other matters on the panel. Uh, and I share the view, and I think it's really rather frightening because, and I just stress this point, we barely afforded this crisis. I don't think the Western world is in a position to cope with another one. And it would be, uh, I think, I understand Larry Summers has been talking about our being in 1914. Um, well, I don't want to go there, but uh, we just escaped 1929, and we can't go through this again. So this is a very, very big issue. The second thing that comes out, I think there's no disagreement from anyone who talked about this, that there is a, prof obviously some could say more about it than others, there is a gigantic political problem here. Uh, inside or outside a problem of the extreme form, both in terms of information and knowledge and in terms of political presence. It's a Mansur Olsen problem on the absolutely enormous scale. And my sense is this has certainly not got better and probably worse. The third is I think there is a consensus or near a consensus. I don't know whether anyone, I don't think hear anyone who said it was not part of the answer, that having a hell of a lot more capital in these institutions would be really a good thing. Um, and we, can, we could live with that. Uh, and it seems to me clear that that is direction. It seems to me pretty obvious from what Andy said uh, th uh, that having all our major financial institutions unable to bear a loss of 5% of the value of their balance sheet is simply insane. It is structurally insane. It's just asking for trouble. We can have a debate about how much more, but clearly it's much more. There is some disagreement on how far clever regulation, better knowledge of the operation of the financial system, and a combination of pretty brutal incentives uh, would also go to improve the system. My own view is clearly putting the odd banker in jail would have been a good idea, um, and, uh, and I love the idea, I really love the idea, particularly relevant in the US, that if you really are going to say that corporations are people, then there are certain consequences of being a person. And one of them is you can go to prison. Uh, so that seems to me quite important. But of course, it's perfectly obvious they're, they're, in, they're, pe they're people when it's convenient for them to be, and not people when it's inconvenient for them to be. Um, uh, and and um, so there's this incentive side. I personally, I have to say, hope that better supervisory procedures, better understanding of the risk map, uh, Andy's dream of the, the full knowledge of the system uh, will be possible. But I have to say, at the moment at least, I am profoundly skeptical that that's going to be very effective in the near term. But that's just my view, and what does that count for? Nothing at all. 
But I think we had a wonderful discussion. It was reasonably brought together. And if anyone has gone away feeling optimistic and cheerful about the state of the financial system and therefore of our entire global economy, that person is seriously deluded. Thank you. <laughs>